Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, and this is the Major Markets Report for Fundamental Trends and Margin of Safety Investing. I have Shooter with us today and Teresa. They can wave because their mics are off at the moment. And uh, we're going to go through a couple of things. First, some house cleaning. Shooter's primary waves are going to be almost exclusively in the group chat from here on out. And he'll do a quarterly piece, special report every quarter. But as he sees charts, rather than going through the trouble of writing an article and publishing, going through all that stuff, he has a way of just posting them up here real easy. So that's what he's going to do, make life easy. And they'll be in real time and, uh, you know, take some take some work off of his plate. And what I would like to do going forward with the Investing 2020s uh, website is if we talk about specific stocks, then we're probably going to put those on a time delay. Shooter's swing trading will be published, but after the fact. And uh, I'm hoping that he goes back to just doing a weekly review on Friday or Saturday with kind of a look forward. But then when he gives you specific instructions on a trade, he can do a two-minute video, put it on YouTube as unlisted, and then uh, just share it with you in the chat room. So we're going to use the functionality of the chat rooms at Fundamental Trends more because it really takes a lot of busy work off of our plate. And I think that that is the most effective. Also, I know, I mean, we've got a few thousand followers now on YouTube. And frankly, there's a lot of people getting our stock picks and our trades uh, that aren't really paying for it. So if you want the trades on time, buy a subscription. There's all sorts of discounts out there. So uh, try us on for a year and see if you like it. So what happened this week? Anything, anybody notice anything new? Anything change in the world? Well, it turns out that Donald Trump won. I was worried about that uh, because I think that uh, there is the potential for a lot of economic disruption. And, you know, I guess a lot of other things that people don't like too. So the popular vote in the United States was, I think, the closest in history. Uh, it was almost exactly 50-50. I, I don't know who's up a tenth and who's down a tenth at this point, but I think after California, maybe Kamala was up by a tenth. But in the swing states, uh, she got waxed. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't really that close uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I could see at 11 o'clock at night that she was going to lose uh, because she was behind in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. It was shocking to me that she was behind in Michigan. I don't know if she's going to pull out Arizona when the last vote is counted, but regardless, it didn't matter. Uh, she lost Georgia handily. Uh, North Carolina uh, got destroyed in Iowa. You know, people were trying to say that she might win in Iowa. Not even close, eight points or 10 points. Uh, North Carolina, she lost by six points, something like that. I don't think that she is talking about the things that she needs to talk about on inflation and immigration. And she never said that. And so I think millions of people never heard her talk about the economy or energy, which ended up getting in a pretty high ranking for policy ideas uh, or, or immigration, which we all know we need immigrants, at least most people on this call know that we need immigrants, but we've been doing a really bad job of how we do it, right? You, you just can't let people come across and and not like check in, right? Not apply for a work visa. But we have crummy work visa policies. We have screwed up the entire immigration system. It's not one party or the other. It's both parties have sucked on this back to the 1990. And until they fix it, it's going to be bad. Even for Trump, it's going to be bad because there is no financial way. There is no manpower way to, exp to deport, export, to deport a whole bunch of people. And the thing is, is we really shouldn't want to. We need them for labor because we know that for every baby boomer that retires, only half a person is taking their place. So two baby boomers retire, one Gen Zer, or I guess there's a handful of millennials not working yet, but there, there's half as many people we need in the country right now to replace the boomers leaving the workforce. What happens if the workforce shrinks? That means the economy shrinks. Do you want the GDP to, to go down? That's called a recession. And what if supply chains get mucked up again, right? We end up having a possible stagflationary period, which is really just not what we want to see. So we have some issues to deal with. We'll see what the policies actually end up being 
I don't know if I trust Elon Musk. I think he's in it for himself. Uh, I think that he has some tendencies that are questionable. I think he has ethics that are, I don't really know the right word. He has a set of ethics that, in my opinion, um, are special. I, I don't know what to say about what his ethics are. Um, I think that there are some things that I think are questionable. And I think that he rationalizes what he's doing based on a set of ethics that maybe not everybody agrees with. So we'll have to see how much influence he has. And that's the headline here in Bloomberg. What does Elon Musk get for $130 million? Uh, Because he pretty much swung the election here, right? I mean, he's got 200 million people on, on, on Twitter, X, and maybe a third of them are American voters. You know, when you pound a message in, and we know this about propaganda, when you say something over and over and over again, it becomes true for some people. And I think that a lot of that happened. I think that the millennials, who I have talked about over and over again, the new force in the economy, but I think the millennials feel like after walking into 9-11 when they were in school and uh, the financial crisis when they were looking for their first and second jobs, that they really want to be in it for them. I don't think they care too much about the boomers at this point. I think that they make that very clear. And when I say they, slight majority, right? Uh, maybe just a large minority, hard to tell. But there's a, a good number of millennials who have a combination of, I got to do this for me. And then they don't really know what they're doing because their experience level with the economy with cycles, right? It's just they don't have any experience yet, right? They've seen a, they've seen one big cycle. What they're going to see now is a new cycle. And I want to go over a couple of things about what Donald Trump is inheriting because he is inheriting a really good economy. We've been talking about this for a couple of years. Donald Trump is inheriting an awesome economy. He's not inheriting a mess. How do I know? Well, we can go to any number, any number of websites. Remember back when these charts were down here and everybody was screaming recession? And I said, no, this is an inflection point. Look what's happened over the last three quarters. Logistics Managers Index has, has, has rallied. What stock did I mention to you four or five months ago? UPS, right? Financial conditions are looser than when the Fed was tightening. So we don't have tight financial conditions. People can say that they don't like the high interest rates. They're not high. They're normal. Employment is looking good. I mean, you can go through any of these charts, and this is daily chart book. You go through any of these charts, and it's chart after chart after chart after chart that the economy is getting stronger right now. Now, do I think there will be a little lull over the winter? Yes. Why? What do we talk about with the economy? What's the first quarter? The first quarter is the reset every year, right? We run out the inventory. We see what sales were during the holiday season, our our, our self-designated six weeks of shop, shop, shop. And we'll see what happens. So when you go through all these charts, I'm going to start putting a lot more of these in articles, what you find out, and and really, honestly, if you're investing money, you should know this by now. It's pretty good for you, right? So if you have money to invest, it's pretty good for you. And we have more millionaires in this country today than ever before. The number of millionaires has what, almost doubled in the last four years? So when people say that it's rough on them, who are you talking about? I would think that people who haven't had the budget to be able to save money, that's who it's been rough on. And they voted more for Trump than they have in the past. Why? Because Kamala didn't address the economic elephant in the room, which was inflation, right? Inflation has flattened, but prices didn't come down. Food is still expensive. I'm shocked every time I go to the store, right? I I can't get a piece of beef for under 15 bucks a pound. Not that I need anyway. I mean, there's there's certain pieces of meat I guess you get for five, six bucks a pound at this point. You better be really good at tenderoid, tenderizing, right? So go through all the charts, go to Daily Shot, go to Apollo or the weekly chart storm over here from Tom Callan Thomas. I subscribe to all these. This is Torsten Slock. He was on uh, Bloomberg Today. You know, go, this is free. This one's free. If you're not subscribing to the Daily Spark from Apollo, you're missing out. This is one of the best free resources on the internet. You should be looking at it every single week, at least once. You know, this is this is like Sunday morning reading. So where are the market? Well, if you are in our chat rooms, you get all kinds of great charts. So let's go through some of them. 
let's start with the U.S. dollar index. And I'm going to bring in Scott and Teresa because I'm going to start asking them some questions. I have asked you guys to unmute, so go ahead and do that. All right, this is the dollar basically during my lifetime. What can you say about the dollar? It looks pretty range-bound, doesn't it? Only once did it spike. That was Volcker, right? That was to kill all the 70s inflation from the oil embargoes and everything else that was going on. And then it's been range bound. So we had a collapse in the dollar here during the financial crisis. And what have I told you? I have told you when the dollar gets too low, it breaks the economy. And when the dollar gets too high, it causes inflation in other countries. That's an important point, And I want you to keep that in the back of your head. If the dollar getting too strong can cause inflation in other countries, what might other countries do to make sure that they have a hedge against the dollar? We're going to cover a couple of those things. What we know is that when the dollar gets too strong, other assets get, get lower priced. So Donald Trump was trying to get the dollar to come down. But the economy here is just so darn strong. And we really, you know, if you don't believe in American exceptionalism at this point, you just need to read more. Because our economy has so many advantages over every other economy in the world from best rock, right? This is the best piece of geography on the planet. Stroke of luck, right? They went across an ocean. They found the best rock on the planet. Hey, yay! Whoever went across the ocean, right? Yeah, it was some Vikings, right? Oh, wait, there are people here already. Mm. Anyway, so we have the best rock. We have, even when we try to break it, a pretty good legal system and property rights and capitalism for all its faults, right? The worst system, except for all the other ones. So... We have really everything going from us, technology, education, even though we keep watering it down. We've been watering the education down since the 1980s. At some point, we will choose to invest in education. Hopefully, the millennials are insisting that their kids get a good education uh, and the Gen Zers. Grandpa here is going to make sure of it. So if we can keep our education level, if we choose to watch what goes on over the next four, eight, or 12 years and constantly learn from what's going on, if the millennials choose to be open-minded, then things all, all work out. Now, here's the flip side. And here's what Kamala ended up running on, which was, hey, Trump's going to come here and ruin the whole system. I don't know. It's a pretty resilient system. He didn't wreck it the first time. I mean, he kicked it in the junk, but it got up. So in four years, can he wreck it? I don't know. I mean, I think he can cause a financial crisis, but I think that America repairs itself. So what we're really talking about is the shape of the curves, the magnitude of the curves, and just exactly when things happen. So as investors, we need to respect what the data tells us. And when it comes to equities in particular, but also bonds, as I'm going to show you in a second, we need to be aware of the trends. If you don't respect the technicals. And I'm not saying that you have to be a chartist, but if you don't watch what we're doing with these charts, if you're not understanding the story that these pictures tell you from the underlying mathematics, right? All these different indicators, if you don't respect it, then you're going to have a subpar investment experience. That's just the way it is. The millennials have become better traders than the boomers ever were. It's not even close in my opinion. And the boomers can say, well, but, 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 but no, I saw boomers sell at the bottom of every bear market, every single time. Who bought at the bottom in 2020? It was the young people. Now, hedge funds go after young people. Why? Because they're not smart enough to know any better when things are rough. Ah, let's just go in there and see what happens, right? That, that's that, You can watch the big short. Watch any movie that they talk about how they recruit hedge funds and uh, uh, investors and investment bankers. They want brave and stupid. Stupid, right? Not stupid like can't read a book, but like stupid doesn't know that you might get run over by that truck that's coming around the corner. So they try to recruit those types of people. And what has happened is because of the internet and everybody decided they needed a hobby when they were getting their, their unemployment checks during those eight months of COVID or whatever it was. How long do people get checks? A year and a half? Um, they learned how to trade and they took their lumps and it happened fast. And so when I wrote that article in 2020 that the millennials were becoming the most important group in the economy and it was happening fast, fast forward four years, hands down, not even a question. They are the most important money in the market. Why? Because they're the ones adding money to the market. The boomers are net on net withdrawal as of right now. This is the year that boomers start taking money out. That's really bad for pensions, right? So pensions 
are going to have to start selling equity. One of the reasons interest rates have been high for a couple of years is because I think they were letting the pensions buy bonds so that they can plan out their incomes because a whole bunch of pensions are only 70, 80% funded. We'll see how many bailouts there are in the future. Uh, there's going to have to be some. All right, so this is my chart on the dollar. And what it says is that the dollar is likely to surge upward. Keep that in mind, it's important. This is Teresa's chart, and we have charts from Shooter too, but I don't need, don't need to show them because frankly, these are easier to read, but they all tell the same story. So Teresa is wondering, are we going to see the dollar come down? And I think maybe we do. It's just a question of those are, you know, have a rally first. If it has a rally first, then you probably get a stock market correction because when the dollar goes up, bonds go down. So we'll see what the Elliott waves are saying. Shooter, I can't show your chart right now, but is your analysis that the dollar is more likely to go up short term? Uh, my range is roughly to about 107 and a half on the high side. Much higher, just a are little overshooting bit. right now. So the way that I'm looking at this is, is like a B, um, and then we have a C that comes into the downside, very similar to uh, what Teresa has on her chart. Um, so more like this. Than yeah, however, we do push above about 108, 109. It kind of invalidates the downside. Okay. So what you think is that the AI algorithm here probably is wrong and that this one is more likely to be correct. I, if, in my opinion, it needs to, and part of the reason is the stress that it's putting on emerging markets is, and, and you know, to a great degree, you know, this is an area that's complex in currencies that I grasp, but I don't grasp it as well as others. And, you know, we had one heck of a push coming into the election here. And I think to some degree that will come off just as quick as it came on. That's it, same thing I'm looking at with the indices. I think that we come off to some degree and we're overshooting on both of them. Uh, and I think we're even overshooting a lot right now in crypto. So I I think the the uh, FOMO that came in, you know, the Trump thesis of winning that you know we're going to have these improved conditions right away, um, to some degree is flawed. That's that's my thought. So I'm looking at all of this as overshoots. So I'm being very hesitant to get long on any of these. So as far as the dollar goes, you're thinking that this rally here might have been almost it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not it so sure. Overshoot, it overshot the count by 18%. So it, it wasn't enough to break, you know, our prior high, uh, which came in, you know, right around 107, which I had as a, a primary wave two. Um, we really need to break above that for it to change the structure. And then we have one other prior high prior to our July 2022 high. Um, and it just doesn't, you know, structure, it doesn't look like it's going to turn into an impulse or a bullish leg, whether it be an ending or leading diagonal, because it's just too broad. This is clearly a flat, and flats play out a specific way. So if it's a flat, what does the S&P 500 look like then? Because right now, there's there's a higher target up here. Yep. But there's also, the Elliott waves are starting to say, look out for a decline. So Correct. I think it's just a matter of when it starts, right? To some degree, you will see it in the time frames as far as the divergence. What, you know, and right now, what we're still seeing is they are aggressively buying the dips. I'm seeing it in futures when I'm in it every morning at six. And, um, you know, they're not backing off. We still are running the same structure that we ran back into October 22. That's, it's not changed. They still are coming in buying specific names and then they're rotating into other names. And what we did see going into this election is we started seeing, you know, 500 block contracts come in, which we have not seen really in the last two years. So we had a lot of money coming off the sidelines in this push. Now, that said, you know, my experience and the mentors that I've had has taught me that when we're in this level of exuberance, the markets can push a lot higher and a lot quicker than we can expect. So just get the heck out of the way and wait for you, wait till you get a, a better entry or something to look at because it'll just steamroll right over you. And that's sort of my mindset right at the moment. So I just want to point out these bars on the left side of the chart. This is volume. Right. Volume was super high during the bear market. That's typical. People sell, they panic. And then they start to buy on the way back up. What can you see over here? You're seeing that there's fewer and fewer buyers as this goes higher and higher. And in fact, 
even though the market was up a ton today, volume wasn't particularly high. It was pretty average no. volume. So we're not seeing big checkbooks price the market. What we're seeing is small checkbooks price the market and they're just buying at the margin and they're pushing the price up. Yeah. So there's still 25 to 50 contracts is what we're seeing, which is not retail. That's commercials. That's too big. The, av the average trader is trading one to five contracts. When you start seeing those blocks, you know it's commercials just for that reason. But it, but it's it's small. It's hedge funds. It's traders. Right, but it's still a, it's still 150 grand trade plus. So you're not going to see a lot of small account and small accounts less than a couple million bucks are not going to be trading with that size. They're going to limit their risk to half a percent or one percent if they're trading futures. Well, I, I will tell you that trades that size are not institutions. They are guys like me. So they are 30 and 40 and $50 million money managers because that's $150,000 trade. We're not seeing gigantic blocks like we did down here, right? This is three or four times bigger than the, than the volume that we're seeing here. So if the volume is a quarter of what it was two years ago, that should tell us, and these bars tell you right there, that interest as the price goes up is falling off. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have the $30 million manager who's a trend follower, who's following the momentum, and he's willing to jump out in four days, right? That's that's who's buying right now. I know that's who's buying right now. So it's not Vanguard. It's not BlackRock. It's, it's not even family office, probably. It is the small eight-figure hedge fund uh, for the most part. It's the people on the Citadel platform or on the Nomura platform. That's the type of trader that gets the size block that you're talking about. So if the Vanguards and Black Rocks and the TCWs and everyone and the big guys out there, T. Rowe Price, if they're not creating spy volume, then that means that they're either selling or doing nothing. And I think the question becomes, what do they do next? And at this point, I think it's unlikely that they chase into the end of the year, maybe the last day to do some window dressing. But I think it's very possible that you're going to continue to see these volume bars get smaller and smaller as this goes up, which is why the algo is saying, you know, maybe we get over 600 uh, on SPY. But it's been it, when, when it puts up a chart, because it doesn't put a chart on everything, it only puts a chart on things that fulfills what the algorithm needs to make an estimate. So they're aiming up here. It is largely volume weighted. I'm a very volume weighted guy. I respect the Elliott waves and I understand that, you know, this could keep going up. It could turn here or turn here or turn here. But what this Elliott wave algorithm is showing you is that at some point, a move kind of like this is going to happen. And the volume weighted analysis is saying that it's going to happen somewhere between now and up here somewhere. That That's what it's saying. So with yours, which is geared more towards short term, I think we stay long till April 25, according to the count. So you think that this pushes all the way up here in the spring? Yeah, my my stop right now is 567.89 on the spot. It closes below that, I change my mind. Okay, well, you're a very nimble trader. So, you know, I think for most people, the, the takeaway here is that you have to understand that somewhere in here, it's going to get hiccupy, right? And we don't know if it's right here or right here or right here, but it's in this range, going to get hiccupy. What do you think, Teresa? Uh, yes, we're getting stretched. I think when you draw that it, it, on the chart that I had, you drew a trending channel and you can see it. Um, actually, it, it's kind of pretty because the, the lower channel that's not as steep as the monthly one, even though that's a weekly chart I'm showing, I, uh, I pumped up the monthly trending channel on it. And then you can see that weekly trending channel um, just pushing price up to the top of the monthly. And now we've got that confluence of both the, the monthly and the weekly getting up to the top half of the trending channel with RSI readings that are 70. So that's not to say it's going to go tomorrow. It could, but it will, we'll see it. We'll see it in the daily. Um, but yeah, it's, it's getting high. It's not going to stay up that high. It can't. Right. So this is where I think we remind people what fractal means. Moves within moves. So your big channel, your monthly range is between these lines. And when you get towards the top of the monthly range, then you tend to head back down to the lower end of the monthly range. And this middle line, sometimes it bounces off, right? It might, might get to here and then go back up. 
that is indicative of how RSI works. So if RSI gets stretched, you usually see a correction. So back here in the end of 2021, you had this period where RSI stayed high, and then you get a nine-month bear market. Then it came back up. We got the sell-off for how long did it last? It didn't last long. It was like it was like from April to September bottom. It kind of chopped a couple times. And now all of a sudden, that was last year. Now all of a sudden, it's been chopping up here again, here and here and here. But look at that. Lower high, lower high, lower high. You know, can it j jump around in here? It sure can. Uh, I, I don't disagree with Shooter. I, I think that there's enough animal spirits, and we know that the 401k money pours into the market from uh, December to March, a little bit into April. So, I mean, I think the market could stay strong until spring sometime. doesn't mean it will. It just means it could. And, and I think it's important that people just understand what Teresa and Shooter and I are all saying. Could it go a little higher? Absolutely. Could it last four, five, six more months? Absolutely. Are we getting into the danger zone? Yeah, I think so. So QQQ, pretty similar. The thing that I, I like to remember, remind people about QQQ is that since the dot-com crash, every single rolling three-year period, and I think all the two-year periods, it has outperformed SPY. Why? It is because it is a newer index with better methodology and a more focused portfolio, only 100 stocks instead of 500. So that means it will necessarily be more volatile but if well-constructed, it should outperform, which it has. It turns out that seven or eight of the top 10 companies are on the NASDAQ as far as sales, as far as revenues, uh, excuse me, as far as profits, and as far as cash on the balance sheet. The exceptions are Berkshire Hathaway and Salesforce and just a couple of others, Exxon, Chevron, if you want to say that they have growth, which I don't. I don't think they have growth, but I think that they have pretty strong position to protect themselves unless the price of oil collapses. If oil and gas collapse, you know, then even they have a problem. But with QQQ, here you see how relative strength indexes work. It's been high for a while. And we know that we usually get a rally after it's been down here. And we usually get a correction after it's been up here. And we really haven't seen a correction in the last year, a couple five percenters, right? So if this shoots back up here, and right now it seems like it's going to, um, you know, I, I wasn't so sure if Kamala won, if that would have been true. But I think with Trump, because who's he going to fire? He's going to fire Lena Khan, right? Day one. Uh, she might she might quit before then. So she doesn't get fired. So there's not going to be a whole lot of regulation going forward, right? Trump doesn't believe in it. Musk doesn't believe in it. It's the mantra of the GOP, cut regulation. So I don't see anybody fighting back against the oligopolies. I don't see anybody fighting back against mergers and acquisitions. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it is. So as far as my personal opinion about some of this stuff, they don't listen. So what's the point? I think that you're probably going to see more mergers and acquisitions. I think you're going to see big guys buying little guys, even though for the last four years they haven't. Because why? Trump's going to let them. And I think that you're going to see, and this is an article that I'm writing uh, for Permian Basin Magazine uh, for their next issue. Under the Trump administration, I think you're going to see more mergers and acquisitions uh, in oil and gas. Deals that were getting pushback from Lena Khan at the FTC, she's going to be gone. And I think that you're going to see a lot of these mergers and acquisitions happen. Uh, I don't think Trump is going to care too much about energy prices like he did the last time. Why? Because he can't run for re-election, right? doesn't matter to him. He wants what he wants. And I think what he wants is a much more business-friendly environment. And, and I think he's going to want to get his paycheck on the way out the same way they all get their paycheck on the way out when they go and do million-dollar speeches, right? So I don't think that energy is, and, and I bring this up now because it has to do with the, the trade ideas and the oligopolies here in tech. And now that tech and energy are tied at the hip because of the AI data centers needing energy, it just seems to me that we are setting up for some big rallies, but also some big corrections at some point. And I don't know how high QQQ can go. Shooter, how much are you seeing QQQ rallying to? We are overshooting now. <laughs> um, How's that? My count is 50208, and we are above that, and it's not adjusting, which is an overshoot as far as I'm concerned, because it's not measuring. So I have a correction coming in between now and the end of December, where we pull back to about 465. Well, if that happens, then then Spider has to have a correction too. 
Not necessarily. They've been diverging for about 90 days now. Hmm. Let's take a look. So in 90 days? Yep. They've been, I mean, depending on where your flows are, money goes into the NASDAQ, money comes out of the NASDAQ, goes into the SPY. Same thing with the Dow. I mean, what we just saw on the Trump pump, uh, we had rotation into the Russells, which completely overshot the Russells as well. The Russell family. Um, I don't know. This looks pretty close, man. No, I'm saying divergence as far as flows. I mean, you're not going to see it on a weekly um, or an hourly, actually, because they're they're pumping in and out at, you know, 30 minute intervals. They're into the Russells. They're into the Dow. They're into the NASDAQ. They're into the SPY. And they're going to the other one, trying to pump it. So you're saying a move like this is what could happen, right? This happened yeah. back in June where yeah. they really broke apart. So I mean, you're saying it wouldn't they could... be that extreme down to 465. We're only talking 35 bucks. So I'm just seeing that I'm seeing the NASDAQ much more likely to roll over than the SPY at this point because the SPY has invalidated the flat, whereas the NASDAQ has not. Right now, my top on our cycle wave three is at 519.66. And then that correction. So we got one pump up to a primary wave three, a flush down to 5465. Then our pump to our cycle wave three around 519. And then we flush again back down to about 465. So the, the flush, which is a cycle wave four, doesn't come in until about April of 2025. So in my opinion, the SPY will be in a bullish mode during that period of time, whereas the NASDAQ should roll into a flat. And that has a lot to do with how they chase, chase the Magnificent Seven, and they sort of let the SPY sit there for a longer period of time. So I see that rotation. I see no reason it should stop. Okay, so let me wrap my head around that then. So if the weaker market for maybe the next six months is going to be QQQ versus SPY. SPY has got 500 stocks, QQQ has 100, and they're all on SPY. That means that we have breadth that is expanding, right? Yeah. Because if for SPY to go up and QQQ to go up less or even roll over, that means that the breadth has to start expanding to the next 400 companies. Does that sound right? Yeah. Well, you just look at your moves from earnings this quarter in the NASDAQ versus the SPY. Just look at the percentages. Okay. I mean, it's yeah, well, 20% we percent all kinds of stocks five percent or more today. Yeah, no, it's the 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 earnings are twenty percent higher than the prior earnings in the spy versus the Nasdaq. So that you're right, the breadth is growing, but okay. what we're seeing is that same rotation. They're chasing names. So that's consistent <laughs> with what thinner. I've been saying about earnings growing because of AI or whatever other reason. Okay. Fact set says that earnings are growing over 10% in the S&P 500. Agreed. I think it'll be 15% next year. Yeah. Well, and if earnings go up that much, then what that means is that PE isn't as high as people think because the E is going to go up. So if right now the PE on S&P is what, 22, 21, something yeah, like that. I didn't look recently to quote that. So that was, let's say it's 20. So that means 20 is the P and one is the E. That's not true, but that's an easy way to think of it. If the if the one goes up to 1.2, then all of a sudden your PE is 16. And that's kind of normal. So if we get an earnings expansion, which is what Luke Grumman has been wondering, he hasn't committed to it happening. I have. Uh, Luke Grumman asks, if we can have an earnings miracle over the next few years as we get a building boom, which is what I've talked about, but he hit some of the things that he said are very similar to what I've been telling you for three, four years now, you know, the, the flyover country, the great lakes region in particular going to have a building boom and it's already starting. I mean, right. when guys like me can ask people for million dollar checks, they say, sure. Um, kind of, a, <laughs> you know, it's happening. So you have a building boom, you have AI, you have all sorts of efficiencies. You have labor costs that aren't going up very much anymore. Suddenly, the corporations, after what, two or three years of flat earnings, they could have a pretty big step up in earnings over the next two, three years. What, what do you, what yeah, do you that, think, that Teresa? Be the I mean, a simple scenario that sort of explains that. You know, we've had what percentage price increases across the board. What happens if the cost of goods drops 20% and they don't lower their prices? What does that do? Right. Right. That's all. It's all margin. Exactly. Right. So what does that look like to you, Teresa? The um, No, I agree. I I don't see any reason why the earnings and things don't don't keep going forward. I'll say this just from a charting point of view. It would be easy to see that QQQ 
just run sideways a little bit. I mean, that's how you, that's another way to revert to the mean is just chop along a little you bit. You still be getting a version, but I don't think it gets that deep. I think they hold it up. Yeah. Right. So if you go back to that 2014 to 2016 period, let me do some stretch in here, right? It didn't go up much during this period, right? It had a rally, got to about here. And then from the end of 2014 to middle of 2016, so seven quarters, same spot. So it's not unusual for the market to chop sideways for a year or two. And, you know, if you go to Crestmont Research, Crestmont Research shows all these cycles too, where things go sideways for a year or two. I'm not saying I believe that will happen. Um, I'm just saying we need to be aware of these types of scenarios because we need to adjust to them over time. Now, Stanley Drunkenmiller said something in his interview that you should find. It's out there uh, from this week where he said, look, I'm a macro investor, but I do it from the bottom up. People are like, what does that mean? He goes, mm -hmm. I develop my macro theme by what the companies are doing within the industry. I don't start way up at the top and work my way down. I start way down at the business level and say, okay, what are they doing that works? And then how does that build into the macro theme? So he looks at it from the bottom up, which is everybody who's been reading me and listening to me for years and years knows that's how I do it. So I, I you know, and I just try to copy smarter guys. So, you know, I think as the companies go, that will push the macro narrative, the, nor the, the macro story. And we will see what happens. As far as share prices, we know that that comes down to liquidity. If there's a lot of money in the system, right? Lots of liquidity, prices tend to go up. If liquidity is contracting, like during 2022, prices tend to come down. So what we have to figure out is, is liquidity going to go up the next couple of years or is it going to start falling off? There is an article actually on Seeking Alpha today that was pretty good where he talks about quantitative tightening is up to $2 trillion. And we've talked about quantitative tightening a really, really long time. In fact, somebody has an article on Seeking Alpha. Yeah, the M2 money supply is already increasing again. So we've, we're, we've had our trough as far right. as at least my two cents at this point. Right, right. No, I mean, financial conditions have been loosening since, since April. So if we look for, let me see, let me see if I can look this up. You know, actually, there is an argument, too, that what China has been pumping into their markets actually could be a big factor in why we've been as elevated as we have the last couple of weeks. Right. Just like I had, you know, I think it was in chat, actually, I had mentioned that, you know, it's two to six weeks out from when they pump money in before we start seeing the trickle down effect in the U.S. indices. And we're here. So that um, and, you know, my argument still is that they can't stop here because if they stop, they fail and they go into a very serious recession and potentially a depression, which obviously would echo around the world at some point. But I think they're going to continue to print. So that's another reason I think certain areas of the market are more prone to have a continued rally as long as that money supply continues to pump. And now you bring the Fed in and they start jumping on the bandwagon as well, or BOJ steps on the bandwagon. You know, there is a potential we have some significant upside from here. Right. So this is what I said about quantitative tightening way back at the start of 2023. And it's it's why the bear market ended pretty quick is because financial conditions stopped getting tight after about a year. And they actually started getting looser in April when what did the Fed do? It cut its quantitative tightening in half. So now they're not really closing out as many bond positions as they were. And it wasn't enough to offset the increased borrowing by the Treasury. So on net, we've seen more money go into the market since spring than we did the year before. And interestingly, could have been political a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. there's no doubt that they play games. So the question I think we ask is, at what point do we have to flatten out the financial conditions again? And I would once again point towards real estate and business development. We know that interest rates are almost to the point that really stimulate um, building projects that have a high enough internal rate of return. We're like right on the border right now. So if Powell lowers interest rates, is it next Wednesday? Tomorrow. Is it tomorrow already? Hey, tomorrow, the 8th, 7th, 6th, whatever it is. No, I, wait, I, I, I'm point. on the ball with Powell, let me tell you. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. if he lowers by a quarter point and then does it again in December, even if he pauses after that, I will tell you that five-year loan rates and building rates only need to come down about a half point. from. They don't have to come down very much maybe even a quarter point, the internal rate of return on projects has jumped from about 13, 14% to about 16, 17% in just the last two months, which is why when you put out your pro forma numbers, because you want to build a $20 million building or you're building a factory or whatever, if you can borrow for that year or two while you're building and then do a five-year note, because mortgages for business and for commercial aren't 30 years or 20 years or five or 10 years. So, and, and they're rarely 10 years they're almost always five. So we're suddenly at a point where you can unleash the money from the money markets to put in the economy. And I don't think there's any way for Powell to put the genie back in the bottle, right? I mean, he, there's no way for him to say, ah, just kidding. We're not going to lower rates anymore. Ah, just kidding. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to tighten up even more. And we can't do it, right? If he, can't doesn't, do it. Cut, if he doesn't cut, we will come down. Markets will take about 3% off, maybe 5 Well, I mean, if Powell stops cutting rates or if he increases quantitative tightening, he could actually cause a recession and fast because we already have a hole in the real estate market because in the last year, nothing was started. Yeah. So well, all the things that just open. finished, hold on, all the things that just finished mm -hmm. are done. Yeah. Right? That's, that's the definition of finished. They're done. So- if we're starting new projects in the spring, because the deals are being finalized now and the money's being collected and contracting for cranes and bulldozers and, and, and contractors and everything else, that means that nothing really is going to get finished next year. It's a little bit inflationary. So there is a window here for the Fed, for Powell, depending on how much he wants his job and who he wants to mess with and what he wants to have happen and how he's going to rationalize things, right? Right. I, I think he's done a good job, but I just don't put it above anybody to have motivated self-interest. So we don't know what's going to happen next year with money. That's if I had $200 point. billion, I'd have no self-interest. What was that? <laughs> well, everybody's got motivated self right? Everybody yeah, wants I completely money. would have a different philosophy. So, so, the, so the Chinese, their motivated self-interest is don't collapse that economy and have all the people get mad at the government to the point where they actually care enough to overthrow the government, you know, to have another Tiananmen Square moment. Mm -hmm. So it is unlikely, in my opinion, that the Chinese back off. So I agree with you. I, I don't think the Chinese back off. I think that they just rebuild stuff, right? I just think they're like, ah, we built it in the past. Ah, we didn't need it. Or it sucks now because it's been sit, sad, empty. We'll just build more, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're going to do. And ultimately, there is such massive overcapacity of certain things like solar panels yeah. that even though we want to build our own solar industry, uh, the reality is that we just really need enough to maintain our own demand because the Chinese can supply like the whole rest of the world. So uh, I think that there's downward pressure on energy prices once we get over the AI data center hump, which... It's going to take about five years. So in the next five years, how does energy shake out? Well, I think the wild cards are, does China avoid a real recession? Does India avoid a real recession? I think the answer is yes. I just think they have too much growth. That's um, their, their economy is yeah, not nearly as mature as ours. And, and our economy is super good. So you got all these big economies, with the exception of Europe, that are in great shape. You know, Europe is just going to, I've been saying this for 10 years, Europe's just going to chop along forever. Great place to go visit. If you retire and, and you can find a spot that's a little cheaper than where you live now and get free healthcare, hey, great. But for the most part, Europe is not a growth economy and probably never, ever will be again, except when they rebuild Ukraine. So what happens with energy? This is something I talked about on Stocks on Spaces on the X Network the show that's kind of two degrees of separation from us. I said that I think that Benjamin Netanyahu between now and the end of the year is going to do whatever he wants. I don't know what that is, but in my head, right, he fired his defense minister yesterday, the one that he was button heads with. So the day that Trump gets elected, his defense minister's out the door, the one that was kind of a check to him. And now he's got through the end of the year to do anything he wants. Teresa, do you remember Muhammad Ali? Oh, yeah. <laughs> remember the rope-a-dope, right? He yes. dances around, he dances around, dances around, lets the other guy pound on him, and then he kicks yep. his ass, mm -hmm. right? I think there's a possibility, and I'm not predicting it, just saying the odds are much higher than I think they've been. I think Netanyahu understands that to beat Iran, he has to cut them off at the checkbook. 
Iran makes money on two things, selling weapons and selling energy. We just put a defense system in the Mediterranean to protect everybody, right? To complement the Iron Dome. What if Benjamin Netanyahu and 70 to 80% of Iran's refining and processing is all within a small area? And then they have their nuclear facilities, and I'm sure they know where all those are. And then they have a pipeline, for, a couple of pipelines of gas to China. What if Netanyahu decides, you know what? Screw them. I'm not going to go kill people. I'm going to blow up their infrastructure. And if there happens to be a nuclear scientist in a nuclear facility, I'm okay with that guy getting blown up. But mainly, I just want to blow up the refineries, the, the petroleum centers, uh, the storage. And I don't know if he'd screw with China, but maybe, right? Blow up the gas line to China. And now Iran has no money for however long, and they can't finance Hezbollah. Hamas, the Houthis. Why do they all start with H? Anyway, I don't want to vilify the letter H. Sesame Street would get mad at me. But hey, you're still a spring chicken. Yeah. So, so my question here is: If Israel by the end of the year does attack Iran, what does that do to energy? And is it a shock or is it not a shock? I actually it's think it's, I think it's a little shock. I don't think it's a big shock. I don't think it is. I think the the big shock is if Iran responds and hits oil fields outside the territory. And they did mention in one of their last threats, they added the U.S. to that threat. Internally in Iran- My best, Ed McMahon, you are correct, sir, <laughs> right? If Iran res is successful in responding, that's the bad stuff. Yeah. I don't think Israel attacking Iran really changes much. I mean, I think Saudi Arabia can bring that capacity online. Our, our capacity is fine short term. We don't really see any demand growth other than cyclical at this point. So unless Iran can blow up the UAE or blow up Saudi Arabia or blow up something else in the Middle East that is you know, creating supply, I don't think it's much longer than a, a few month hiccup. And if they do it in the winter, who cares? The United States doesn't drive until June. And it's more of a shipping problem because right now so many of the straits over there, they're not, uh, they can't run the ships through some of them because the insurance premiums are so high. So the capacity coming out of Saudi Arabia probably isn't going to happen until that lightens up. Um, but that's, you know, I, I can see 15, 20 bucks more in oil. But I, unless, if it doesn't escalate, I see $50 oil. So, I mean, it's really, it's that big of a factor over there. I do think that we see 50 something dollar in oil eventually. I would say probably the next recession, but uh, we'll see. If if suddenly kind of peace breaks out in the Middle East, you know, because that happened, when did that happen last? Oh, okay. Has it ever happened? Right, right. Everybody's thinking, I'm, when did that happen last? Yeah. Okay. Um, if sort of peace breaks out in the Middle East, then uh, then we'll see. But I will I will point out that President Trump was not friendly to Iran. But he wanted to keep oil prices low going into the election. Again, he doesn't have to worry about that again. So I think the odds of a kerfuffle above the normal kerfuffle level in the Middle East is uh, much more like, much more like. It's, you know, that uh, Netanyahu, or however you pronounce his name, in that article I wrote about him, there's some hedges in there that everybody might want to take a look at. Right. Because it specifically yeah. targets exactly what you were just talking about. Right. So, and, and we already own energy assets that should do well with or without that happening mm -hmm. but they'll do better if they do and if people were paying attention we had a bunch of energy stocks that went up five to ten percent today now granted one of them was beat to shit but uh you know a bunch of them went up so let's take a look at tlt the long-term bond which i call recession insurance i want to know how low this can go because if the uh man i forget his name now if the guy on Bloomberg today from TPW, I believe it was. Depends on how high the dollar is. Well, so let's suppose we don't get inflation. Let's suppose that this keeps coming down. Where's the floor on TLT? Is it way back here? Our prior low, well, our second prior low was 82.42. I've got my vulture price down at 70 bucks. I don't think he ever gets below there. I think he gets below 70. So what, what do you think, Teresa? Yeah, I, I thought this one's a hard one, actually. Um, I it's mean, the darn... It's in a downtrend. Yeah. Uh, so if it's in a downtrend, it just keeps going down. It's just going to go up. It's going to find folks that are going to sell. And then it's just going to keep going down. It's just going to keep going until something stops the downtrend. So historically, let's go back to the longer term charts. Historically, 
this area above the red line didn't exist, right? If you if you just keep going back, long term rates and I there's another twenty year Treasury chart and it goes goes back up to here. And in nineteen the early eighties it was way up here, right? So since the dot com crash, right, this century and into the QE age, it has drifted higher. But historically, it can get down in here, meaning that higher interest rate. What if somehow the people who are afraid of the bond vigilantes and Trump doing tariffs, which would drive interest rates higher. What if this really gets down in here again? What if it gets to 70 or 60 even? At this point, doesn't it become like the best recession insurance you've ever had? Yep. Right? So I want to point out something. I bought treasuries twice in my career. I bought them in 1999. I bought them again in 2007. Look at that spike. So from 50-ish to the 70s, 40% move in treasuries in about a year and a half. If you take a look at long-term TLT performance, just this one spike was pretty big, right? It was like 27 or 28 percent. That's why I didn't get creamed during the financial crisis because I bought a whole bunch of bonds and I actually bought XLK, which was a short bank ETF. If we start to see inflation, but the economy hasn't slowed down yet, and if this gets pushed down because of tariffs, folks, this is what you want to look for. You want to look for that price in the 70s, like I think Shooter and Teresa are both talking about. If it gets into the 70s, that's when you buy TLT because it is signaling an economic slowdown. This, I think, might be the most important chart that we watch for signals on everything else. If this keeps heading down, it either means bond vigilantes or inflation or an economic slowdown. And, and a lot of times all those things coincide. So unless interest rates go up to like 10, in which case this gets way down here, right? Then it goes all the way down to the 30s or 40. Can we see interest rates at 10? I don't think so. If we do, we're having the doozy of all recessions. I mean, we're having a financial crisis. We're in World War III. Uh, hey, or aliens. I, I'd rather have it be aliens. <laughs> you know? Taiwan breaks out and we're at 10%. Yeah, I don't think Taiwan's going to break All that up. inflation. Just the, I mean, I, look at the industrial production that's going to come out of Europe and the United States directly related to that. I mean, any escalation. Yeah. And we're back at 10%. That's my opinion. Right or wrong. We'll see. At this point, Trump is going to think about his legacy a little bit, I would think. Right? He likes to be popular. Now he wants to be popular forever. He can't let the Chinese have Taiwan. He can't let Russia have Ukraine. Heck, if I was or, actually... And I wanted that, to take I'd take it before he gets in office. Well, I don't think I don't think Russia can take it before he gets in office. You know, I mean, at this point, Biden can send over whatever he wants to send over. So it's not likely. I don't think that Trump does half of the things in his ne next term as he did in his last one. I really don't. Uh, and you know that I I don't like the guy, but I I think that people think about their legacy. I don't like him either. But I, yeah, what was that? I didn't hear you. I say, I don't like him either. He's what we got. Yeah, right. So, but I, I do think that people think about their legacy. I think they rationalize history. I think a lot of people say stupid things. He's 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 wonderfully entertaining in that regard. So I think as somebody says in the chat room, Trump wants to skim. Yeah, I, I think my opinion, and I tend to get these mostly right most of the time, is I think that Musk and Trump are in it for the money. And I think a lot of the people around them are in it for the money. Remember, I told you, I worked for, for a Rupert Murdoch organization and I got recruited by Breitbart. There's a lot of people who would have taken the money and just said what they were told to say. So, you know, it's, Tucker Carlson is that way. I mean, anybody who thinks that Tucker Carlson is talking things that he believes, well, if he believes it, then he's crazy. But I think he's just saying what he knows he can make money on. It's how he gets a million dollar a year contract or whatever he's got. So, you know, they offered me $400,000 potential media stuff. You know, look at my round head. How, how would I have come off on Breitbart or Fox TV as a, as a, as a pontificator, right? I mean, I'm not entertaining in any way, right? I don't say anything smart. So, you know, I think that Trump, because of what he ran on scaring the shit out of people, I don't think he can accomplish most of it. And I don't think he wants to accomplish most of it. I, I really don't. And I think there's enough people around him who will say, hey, don't do that. Now, he's got racists around him, right? He's got misogynists around him. He's got a lot of bad people around him, like Stephen Miller. I, I think Stephen Miller is a villain from a movie. So, you know, you take a look at some of these people and you're like, okay, what's going to stop them? Well, it's only four years, right? There's not the manpower to deport more than a million people. I mean, they say 10 million all they want. Can't happen. There's just not the manpower to do it. 
there's laws against using the military. They can't change those laws because they're constitutional, not just laws. So, you know, and, and the generals won't do it. I mean, honestly, let, let, let's be realistic. The generals have already stood up to him. They'll stand up to him again. So there's just not a lot of ways for him to completely break it. I, I think that he can hurt it. I don't think he can kill it. And I think that the idea of America is that good. I think we have withstood a lot of stuff. We screwed up before World War II. We screwed up after World War II. We screwed up during World War II. You go right through the list of all the bad things that we've done, all the stupid things we have done. And we've always been able to to fix it, right? So we'll see what happens. I don't think the Trump legacy will be as a peacemaker. I think it'll be as he avoided breaking as much stuff as people think he's going to break. The things that he broke already, I think that is what has to repair itself. I don't think there's a lot of new breakage. Other than if they really do do the tariffs, they really do the tariffs, I think there is a very good possibility that we see another financial crisis three or four years out. So we'll see. I I really do think that that is the big deal. I think that if he does the -the across-the-board tariffs and he inadvertently causes a global recession because that breaks other economies and that passes on to us, I think that that is... You know, I think that's the worst thing that can happen. I think he can cause another financial crisis based on what he talked about. Now we have to see if he does it. So if he does it, well, then 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 we got trouble. And he and he's certainly not. You know, I'm I'm presuming that the House is going to be Republican at this point. I don't know that. I know it's like within two or three seats in either direction. I think they um, got one seat. Yeah. What was that? I think they got one more seat, maybe two. Well, we, I don't think we know until the weekend. But let's presume that they can do a reconciliation bill which means all the tax cuts get extended. Okay, so how can they lower the budget if they do that? They really can't, right? The deficits will stay where they're at because there's really nothing they can change in the law that will really change that much, right? The numbers just aren't big enough anymore. So if we keep running the deficits we've been running, which is what it seems like will happen, and we run that into the boomer maximum retirement in 29 and 30, everything everything still keeps shaking out to towards the end of the decade is when we have to worry. And let's remember the repo market crisis. In 2019, the banking system was about to explode. And Jerome Powell came in there and pumped, he, they backstopped trillions of dollars of loans and they ended up putting like $800 billion. So without that bailout before COVID, we were already having a banking crisis without COVID. And I talked about it at the end of 2019. Then COVID came and it disguised everything. So we still have huge COVID disruptions and distortions. We are about to see what happens next. I'll be happy if he just puts Bitcoin in the reserve of the U.S. Treasury. Well, that's I don't know that can legally happen, but Bitcoin is kind of a thing now, isn't it? So Luke Grumman talked about gold. And I want you to kind of look at these headlines. The bricks are recycling gold and they are shifting how they handle their money. And they are putting gold, right? So the bricks recycle trade surpluses in the gold. And then what do they do with the dollars? They put them in the treasury. So suddenly it just doesn't matter. There's always a market for treasuries. The Chinese are the only ones that are buying less treasury. So if gold is a thing and it's super heavy, hard to move, wouldn't it be cool if there was something like gold, but you didn't have to store it in a vault? You could just maybe keep it on a hard drive. Can you think of anything like that, Teresa? Oh, <laughs> right. It's it, it's Bitcoin, right, Shooter? So, you know, I try to explain Bitcoin to people all the time. I actually had a poker buddy. He texted me yesterday. Kirk, tell me about crypto. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> so I, it's, I, I told him just buy Bitcoin and then learn about the other stuff. But really, Bitcoin is different than all the other stuff, right? Everything else that's Ethereum or Solana or whatever has to do with contract. Bitcoin is digital gold. The ECB made a statement recently that said, hey, Bitcoin appreciation could be fueling a division, a wealth division in society. I think they're right. These guys, the IMF, the ECB, they don't get a lot of things wrong. They just really can't do a lot about it the way that we can. Folks, you need to be buying Bitcoin. I've been telling you for two years. Now. Uh, yeah, just about exactly two years right now, right? I started I started pounding this drum exactly in November of 2022. Uh, and, we, and, and actually, we bought a bunch of gold during COVID, or uh, Bitcoin during COVID. And I talked about a gold bull market in 2018 and 2020. So the gold mar- bull market is probably close to over because it's just physically difficult. So 
Bitcoin, though, I think is still early on. Third inning? What do you think, Shooter? Is Bitcoin in the third inning or the fourth inning? It's, it's not late in the game yet. I think it's Second still, inning? I mean, some of the stuff that I've... It all depends on how many sectors we get into derivatives. You know, it becomes an actual reserve currency in any of the top five central banks, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you're talking a range of from 350K to 3 million. Right. I agree. What do you think, Teresa? What do, you, what do your charts say? Hey, I have they a don't, chart. They don't go that high. That's right. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. The only thing you can do is step up and put a super cycle wave on that chart. There you go. <laughs> well, are we you see 1.3 million. <laughs> well, one, two, and three is not complete yet, right? Right. And three is usually the biggest one. Right. What if it goes to 300,000 in the next couple of years because Trump starts stimulating? Mm -hmm. Scott just muted. Unmuted, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it's not done yet. That is that is cycle wave, or that is wave one of a super cycle. So we haven't Oops. even completed the corrective leg, which we will correct probably eh, 86 to 110. I think we get a decent correction there. So this is ABC. We'll start with the ABC of one is what you're saying? Right, on the super cycle leg, yep. So the whole wave here, everything you see on the chart, is not even the completion of wave one in a super cycle. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's, I don't. I, I I look at it. I keep wanting to go buy more futures. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I have been talking about how global adoption of Bitcoin just keeps happening, yeah. and in the Middle East, we know we know this now. It's been reported a number of times. I mean, you can doubt it, but I I I think when you have multiple sources saying the same thing and it seems to have come from different directions, it's probably true. Apparently, a couple of percent of some of the oil transactions between China and, and, and OPEC, they've thrown in a couple of Bitcoin. So it's been partial settlement mm -hmm. of some big international transactions. And I think that with companies adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet, and now Musk having Trump's ear, and Trump clearly is on board with crypto, you know, I mean, even though Biden is the one that approved everything for, for ETFs, you know, that's just because he listens to BlackRock and BlackRock and Fidelity wanted to make a bunch of money, right? But if we have a president who's like very pro, pro, pro crypto <coughs> and the regulatory risk goes away, somewhere in here, one of these articles talked about regulatory risk going away. Maybe that was in the front of uh, Bloomberg today. So the regulatory risk on Bitcoin just went through the floor, right? Right. So folks, the reason I sold Marathon and my 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 Bitcoin miners wasn't because I don't like Bitcoin. It's because I don't want the baggage of the rest of the company. I like Square because I think that they have a great role in small business. So it's a big company that can behave like a small company. I like that. And they own a bunch of Bitcoin. I don't like Tesla because I really don't think they have any edges. And the fact that, you know, I mean, I just don't see how they can make money to justify that market cap. No other company in those fields ever has. So, you know, I like Bitcoin. I just, I'd rather own Bitcoin as Bitcoin. And in client accounts, my OPM money, my other people's money, it's, it's, it's over 10%. It's pushing 12% now just because of the appreciation. In my personal account, in my son's account, my fiance's account, we're about a quarter in Bitcoin. I'm not telling anybody to do that. Just telling you what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm hyper aggressive, but as an asset class, from an asset allocation standpoint, remember, they told you for decades, put five to 10% of your money in gold. Why shouldn't Bitcoin be part of that equation? If it's being adopted by all these big, big checkbook countries, right? Country. I don't really have a Trump impersonation. Country. Bigly, right? If whole countries are adopting and corporations are adopting it, and if family offices, the richest people in society are buying it, how much more follow the money can you get? Teresa, do you like Bitcoin? Oh, I love Bitcoin. You know, I... <laughs> Tell us why. How, how, what was your journey into Bitcoin? Oh, wow. Um, it, gosh, started oh, how long ago? A long time ago because my nephew... Um, got into mining when he was like 10 years old and he's in his thirties now. Has it been that long? Anyway, he was young. Maybe he was early, maybe he was early teenagers, but at any rate, he started mining and that's what got my attention. Um, the kid just made a little money, stuck it on a drive and I started reading about it. So bought a little you bit. You have of a nephew that was buying mining Bitcoin in the first couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He sold it. Unfortunately. 
but um yeah yep no he's he's my he's my crypto buddy actually we um we go back and forth on what we're doing with our crypto okay. <laughs> tony okay well i don't have to buy it anymore because i own it and i for sure can't buy more than other people right i'm regulated i can't buy more for new clients i do but for people who already have a low double digit amount in their portfolio i can't do it now Am I going to sell it? I don't think so. I mean, once the options come out, will I ever write a covered call on some weird spike? Maybe. I'm part of it. But I think that what the ECB is saying here is true. And let's go full circle. Who is the most important money in the market now? Who's the most important money in the market, Teresa? Oh, the millennials. The millennials, right? They like they like Bitcoin. So when you read in Seeking Alpha or Investor Place or Yahoo or wherever it is, Dividend Monkey Guy, whoever it is, say what whatever their all their names are, and they say dividend, dividend, dividend stock. I want you to ask yourself a question. Is it just better to have a higher total return or to have a flat portfolio? But hey, it's getting, you know, it's coming out at five percent a year. You want to be built around total return, which means you need a mix of assets. Do you want income? Yes. Does it have to be from dividends? Not always. We sell all kinds of options. Shooter, Teresa, did you make more in dividends last year or option premium? Oh, option premium by far. Yeah, by far, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it's not even close. I, I make two to four times more in option premium per year, depending on how the cycles go, than I make on dividends. And I own... You know, you know, 10 of the dividend stocks I own, right? Yeah. A bunch of them are 5%, 6%, 4%, right? What does Ford pay? What does uh, Innovative pay? What does Pfizer pay? I'm not anti-dividend, but I want to know that the companies that I own are going to be able to pay that dividend in five years. Because if at any point in the next five years, anybody doubts that they're going to be able to pay the dividend, share price goes through the floor, right? There's an adjustment. So you can't say, ah, I'll worry about it in five years. No, because the market's going to reprice it much, much sooner. So you need to be built around total return. And one of the best total return assets has actually been gold. Gold has done well since 2000. I first got involved in it in 2000 because I had a client. He said gold's $300 a, an ounce. Three, right, right around, I don't know if I got the year exactly right, but it was around there, $300 an ounce. A couple of years later, it was 600 right? And it's going to be 3000 So it's a 10x in 25 years, give or take. It's not bad. Now, is it going to be a 10x in the next 25 years? I don't think so. But I think Bitcoin will be. I think Bitcoin does in the next 25 years what gold did in the last 25 years. If I told you today that you can make 10 times your money in the next 25 years, would you be okay with that? If I said you're going to add a zero in the next 25 years, would you be cool going from a million to 10 million or what, wherever you're at? It's a pretty good return. It's not actually, it's actually very good. It's not, it's not, it's not top 1%, right? The best guys only make even more than that because they double their money every other year. But 10x in 25 years, you're going to beat. 90% of the people out there with that. So think about total return. Think about where the money is and who's moving it there. So you right now, anybody remember the song, Boy in the Bubble? A loose affiliation of millionaires, billionaires, and babies. Billionaires, OPEC. Millionaires, family offices, babies, millennials. Get on the side of those three groups because they're controlling the money. The boomers are filtering out. And if you're a boomer, accept it. I'm not talking negatively about you. I'm just telling you what the trends are. Follow the money. And the money says tech. The money says industry that adopts tech, right? So industry that can use tech to increase their earnings, pharma, biotech, right? I think certain real estate is going to become super valuable because I don't see immigration really slowing down all that much. I mean, there'll be flat periods, but then it'll jump again when we need to replace retiring people and to grow the economy again. So buy some real estate. Have a second house if you can get into one. Avoid Florida. <laughs> yeah. I, I have had some interesting talks with uh, people who have property in Florida, and they're just like, oh, man. I mean, really, they're like, oh, man. It's horrible. In, in some so, of the areas. How's your family doing in Florida there, Shooter? They're good. They're yeah. just they're just uh, outside of St. Cloud, so they haven't really been hit hard at all. They're far yeah. enough inland, which is good. I have two relatives uh, within two blocks of the beach in Naples and in um, Indian Shores, and both of their places got whacked. Yeah. Well, the whole West Coast got clobbered yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to happen again, right? Yeah. There's And there's not really a way to fix it. You can't wall Florida. I mean, yeah. what do you do, build a and wall around citizens, Florida? Yeah, they, can't, they, they can't even wall Manhattan. Yeah. The big problem is in homeowners insurance. Citizens has declined over 50,000 claims, which is the... <gasps> Uh, in, which is the state-managed 
backup insurance fund. Okay. So there's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of properties that are not fixed. Um, well, I heard of one rich guy who said to another rich guy, and I know one of the rich guys, he said, uh, if you're not rich enough to be able to rebuild in Florida, then you probably shouldn't live there. And basically they said, look, you're either rich enough to live in Florida or you're working for somebody that is. <laughs> How's that? Wow. But Florida is going to just purely become a resort state. It's going to become our Dominican Republic at some point. So, all right. Anything else? Any questions, anybody? We're not going to talk about specific stocks. We have a lot of earnings coming up for our companies. How many of you followed me in the Flagstar? I'm going to mention Flagstar. How many of you mentioned me in the Flagstar? Oh, you did? Teresa did? Yep. Anybody? Right here, dude. All right. <laughs> Remember I told you in the last call, one of the reasons I buy things is because there's multiple reasons to own it. You give yourself more ways to win. Flagstar, other than being a cheap bank that was refinanced and has the ability to go through M&A, is Steve Mnuchin, which is a Trump buddy. So several of the things that we own were hedges on a Trump win, the energy company, Bitcoin. But there was other reasons to own them. So stack your ways of potentially winning. Don't buy something that says, well, if this drug works out, it's going to do well. Uh, how about if this goes well, if this goes well, or this goes well, it works out. And if two of them work out, holy cow. And if all three of them work out, mind-blowing, right? Think about your stocks that way. Multiple levels of winning. My dad taught me a lesson when I was a little kid. He brought me to the bowling alley, and I had already bowled in a, uh, at school or in scouts or something. I knew how to hook the ball real young. So he said, okay, show me how you, you bowl. And I had been watching Amleto and Bonicelli and a bunch of other professional bowlers on a professional bowler's tour. It's on TV, right? You sit around the TV and read a book when you're a kid, if you're me. And so I learned how to crank the ball. Amleto and Bonicelli is the one that I copied. And weirdly, when I learned how to golf, I copied Tiger Woods because they both have a hitch. So their hitch is what gave them extra power. So Tiger Woods has a hitch at the top, extra power, hurt his back, but he had extra power to hurt his back. I'm a little Monticelli, about the same thing. I think he might still be bowling at 70 years old. And he would crank it. He lifts his hand up real high and crank it, flitter his wrist open and then really crank it. So anyway, I did that. And my dad was like, where did you learn how to do that? I was like, I copied I'm little Monticelli. He goes, okay, well, I'm going to teach you something then. And I'm telling you, I think I was eight, eight or nine years old, maybe 10. We were living at that house. So we I must have been about 10. He says, look, don't start so far on the inside that you have to throw it all the way back outside because if it doesn't catch, it goes in the gutter. And he showed me how I could hit three or four boards and still get the strike rather than having to throw it over only one board. So anybody who bowls knows that, right? If, if you're going to try to hit, throw a strike ball and you aim at one board and miss, you don't get the strike and you might get a 7 10 split. But if you give yourself three or four boards and they all give you the strike, that's better. Same thing with stocks. You have three or four boards to give you the strike, all right? So we're going to end this. This went late, um, but I thought it was important to talk through all these things. I don't think it's the end of the world. I do think that it could be the end of the world financially for at least a little while at some point. We'll see if he doesn't do the tariffs as aggressively as he's talked. If he doesn't do crazy things like trying to call it the military. If he doesn't create an international situation, right? If he's not as bad as people fear, and they really do tweak some of the things that really should be tweaked on the, econo on the economy, it could work out okay. I don't think it's going to be super, but I think that the secular trends are the secular trends. They will continue. You can't really break them too much. Can you change timelines a little bit? Sure. But remember, Remember this, Republicans don't want to break things either. And a lot of the Congress people are from districts getting a lot of money from the IRA, the semiconductor bill, and the infrastructure bill. I don't think the semiconductor bill and infrastructure bill are at any risk. And two thirds of the money from the IRA have actually been going to red states. Granted, that's almost everybody now. But, uh, you know, these, these Congress people don't want to see that money not going into their state. I don't see too much of the IRA being destroyed. I think the EV tax credits might get changed, but I don't think they'll be changed much. So we'll see. Right. The IRA was largely bipartisan. So I think that because the houses are close, the same way that Manchin and Cinema push back on the Democrats, I think there's enough Republicans. And we know there's at least 10 Republicans in the House that'll push back. Was it 10 or 11? There's 10 or 11 Republicans in the House that'll push back. And I think there's several senators as well. And honestly, let's be frank, Mitch McConnell, even though clearly he's starting to have a health decline, he's not best buddies with Trump, and he for sure doesn't have to run again. I, 
this is it for McConnell. So I don't think McConnell cares if he pushes back his points. And I think Lindsey Graham is about done with them too. Remember, there's a lot of old senators. You know what old senators are? They're old. <laughs> they don't have to care so much. So from a political standpoint, they can say, ah, fuck you. I'm done anyway in three years or four years. So I, I, I'm, I'm not as despondent about Trump on, the, on certain things. I do think the tariffs could, be, could destroy a lot of stuff. I don't think I'm worried so much about the IRA. As far as some of the issues with, with rights, I think that's a big deal. And for whatever reason, that wasn't at the top of a lot of people's list. So we'll see. We will see what happens. But I think if you respect the technicals, understand how money flows work, and keep an eye on some of the big things. Teresa, what is the number one indicator to watch to make sure that the economy is okay? There's two things that the Fed keeps track of. Oh, jobs and inflation. That's right. Inflation, we can all see. If employment turns over, then we have a problem. Jim got that right. So the number one leading indicator is employment. Or the number one, it's not really a leading indicator, actually. It's a trailing indicator, but it's the one that we notice. If employment turns over, it probably means leading indicators have already turned over. So keep your eye on the leading economic in indicators, LEI, and employment. Inflation, you're going to feel. So you don't have to watch it. You'll just go to the store and go, God damn it, eggs are six bucks, right? So... I do. My eggs are five dollars a dozen now. What is that all about? You, see, I love those specials when I can get two dozen eggs for ninety nine cents. Where's that? <laughs> so, all right, everybody. Any last questions? Anybody? Anybody? I know that a lot of you stayed around for the whole call. Somebody raised their hand. Good. Just put your question in the chat. Adam. It's past my bedtime. I didn't pass out. I don't know where the hand is. I'm not going to allow you to talk, Adam. But if you want to put a question in the chat, put a question in the chat. Yeah, Med. Thanks, man. Yeah, I missed you when I was in Texas. Thank you for the cologne yet again. Mm. Got a client down in uh, Houston who uh, we met at a coffee shop. He gave me a gift. All right. Mr. Levins, can you type in a question? You got your hand up. No? Going once, going twice. Shooter, any closing thoughts? Is the world going to end? Nope. Not right at this second. Okay. Teresa? Mind your risk. It, the world is the world is not only not going to end. Actually, I think that a Trump presidency is probably better for us than a Kamala would have. And I did not vote for Trump, but I don't think it's disaster. I just don't. I don't think it's good, but I don't think it's I don't think it's the disaster that people are saying that it will be. Yeah. Well, I I think we're gonna know if. If if they if he does blanket tariffs, tries to call out the military, then it's then I get very angry and very upset, and I sell everything and I short the world. Uh, I will say if that he does tariffs the way that he's talked about, that'll probably bake, break the bond market and then the banking system. So that's what we can keep an eye on. If he does it, then it's probably an opportunity to do a big short trade and shooter. You're on deck then, right? If uh if if the economy starts to break, shooter is going to tell us what to buy. I, I, I covered TLT earlier because for people who don't want to use options, TLT is the easy one. Where is it here? No, oh, there it is. If you just don't want to use options and you just want to get the safety, you want recession insurance, TLT is the one. So if it does get into the 70s, that, that could be a warning, okay? And then you don't have to buy options. You don't have to do anything heroic. You just have to lighten up on all your equities, you know, get it down to well below 50% and buy TLT because TLT ultimately it's going to find these levels eventually. I just don't know if it's three years or five years or seven, but it will eventually get here. So mm -hmm. if you can find the one or two year period where it shoots up, right, that's probably a really good time to, to own it short term. And then, uh, then you buy the equities when they're cheap. Somebody says Paul Ryan in 2028. I wouldn't count on it. I think he's happy doing what he's doing. He hangs out with his kids and he goes hunting. I know that. I know this is true. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you for coming on board, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Kirk. Take care. Great trading, folks. Until next time.